So our text this morning, uh, chapter 2, verses 14 to 19, uh, marks a bit of a shift in this letter. Uh, We've been going through this letter, 2 Timothy, from Paul to Timothy. And for the most part, up to this point, Paul has been talking about discipleship, really. Been telling Timothy, encouraging him, continue to disciple. Uh, As I've I've taught you, you teach others. Uh, It's been a lot about uh, having a sense of uh, confidence in the message itself, and then also a, a heart for the people. And that is going to continue through the letter of 2 Timothy, but there's a bit of a shift now where the focus is going to be not on kind of the manner of discipleship, but the how we handle the Word of God. That's, that's what Paul is going to focus on here, how it is that within the church we, we handle the Word. And by that, I mean uh, how we talk about the Bible uh, informally, just in our, you know, talking in the lobby, talking with, with friends, uh, talking in community group, in small groups, in classes, uh, teaching of all sorts, and certainly in preaching. And so that means this morning there's going to be a part of this sermon which is about sermons which is a little bit awkward, right? Feels like I'm trying to tell you why I'm doing a good job. So I'll just say uh, it's awkward, uh, but that's okay. Because uh, as we go through uh, the Bible, there's always going to be things that either make you awkward or me feel awkward. And if we skipped over that stuff, we wouldn't get to all that God has for us. So it'll be a little awkward. That's fine. Uh, But also you should know this is not just uh, about preaching. This is not just for those who teach kind of in a formal setting. All of us handle the Word of God when we speak about the Bible, when we speak about biblical truths, even when we think about reality, we think about it hopefully in a biblical way. So the Word that God has for us this morning is indeed for all of us. So before I go any further, let me read it. Uh, this is 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 14, which says, Remind them of these things, and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So we'll pause there. That's the word of God to us this morning. And already I think you can see that uh, that idea of handling the word. Uh, Really the key verse is verse 15. So here it is again. Do your best to present yourself, Timothy, to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, Rightly handling the word of truth. So that idea of handling, uh, I think is something that's fairly, I mean, we use that, that, that wording today, right? We talk about handling all sorts of things, how you handle a, how you handle a football, how you handle a, a tool, how you handle uh, a sword is what comes to my mind, although I've never really handled a sword. But you, you, you know what that means. To handle something well means that you're, you're using it well. You're using it in a capable or a skillful way. We know that there are, are right ways to handle things and wrong ways. If someone says, well, he doesn't really know how to handle a nail gun, you would be worried, right? If you're on the job site with them, you would know that means they don't, they don't know the safety requirements, whatever it is. But if you handle something in the right way, a capable way, then you're, doing, you're using it in the way it was intended. And that's, that's what Paul is talking about here when it comes to the word of truth, the word of God. That there is a right way and a wrong way to handle the Word of God. And that the wrong way means that it totally distorts what God intends for His people, but the right way means that it's a blessing, that it's actually being used for the purpose that God intended it, to lift up and and strengthen the church. So that's going to be kind of how we guide our time, organize our time together, is we're going to first look at the wrong way to handle the Word, and then the, the right way. So here's point number one, very simply. There are many wrong ways to handle God's Word. Many wrong ways, and Paul gives us a couple, a couple of them, some big ones. Uh, look at verse 14. He says, Remind them of these things and charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good but only ruins the hearers. And so here, the quarreling that Paul is talking about, I think we, if you've been part of the church for any length of time, I think you know what he's talking about. He's not talking about uh, healthy, genuine 
uh, discussion about theology. He's not talking about uh, two people who are who are uh, really seeking to understand the Word of God and together kind of debate a bit, and maybe there's a bit of a difference of opinion, but you're genuinely listening to the other person and looking back in the Word and trying to figure it out, and you're building each other up. He's not talking about that. He's talking about the tendency that there is within the church for there to be uh, bitter fights about what the Bible says. Quarrels, sharp words, uh, disagreements, that, that are more about things that are going on inside the people rather than what actually is going on inside the, the Word of God. And, and sadly, many of us have been in uh, churches, small groups, whatever it would be, where this, this, this happens. And when Paul says that it does no good but only ruins the hearers, we would say, amen, I, I've seen that happen. I've seen people divided over areas of Scripture where it doesn't really, didn't need to be divided. It was maybe a secondary issue. Right, a third tier theological issue, and yet there's just real strong words, strong forcefulness. Uh, you know what it's like to be in a small group where there's someone who has a soapbox that they're on, and they just always somehow get to the same issue and just and really lay into people who don't don't agree or can't see it. It's disheartening. It's it's divisive. And there's a tendency, I think, in all of us to to be this way. I, I can think of. In my own life, there have definitely been relationships that I have hurt because of my fervor, my, my desire to show what, what I know about the Bible. It's, it's strained. It's almost ruined friendships because I've been so caught up in, in the truth, which, which actually I think is the truth. I, I think that my understanding was correct, but the way that I went about it was all wrong. And so when we think of, of quarrels about words, we shouldn't just think of like a wrong doctrine, right? That someone is, is wrong, but, but also a wrong heart. Because you can have the right doctrine, but have a, a wrong heart about something, and you will mishandle the Word of God. You, you will use it perhaps as a bludgeon, right? Just hammering people down who don't know as much or aren't living rightly. It will end up being something that, that pulls people apart and, and, and brings about a sense of bitterness, rather than what the Word of God should do, which is, yes, a divide between sin and holiness. There are times, certainly, when we need to speak truth into each other's lives. But it should ultimately bring us closer to Christ and, and closer to each other. This is a challenge in any Christian church. This is a challenge in our church. And, and in light of words like these, we, we should take a moment just to think through the way that we've handled ourselves when it comes to theological discussions, right? Are there, are there sharp words when there could be soft words of genuine question? You know, when, when, you, when you hear someone saying something that you don't believe is biblical, is there a sharply worded email the next day? Or is there a, a conversation? Hey, when you, when you said that, um, could you just help me to understand what, what you meant? I just want to make sure, oh, okay, because maybe it was a misunderstanding, Maybe you mis misheard or misunderstood, or maybe they would say, oh, you know what, that, that isn't what I meant. I, I didn't mean it to come off that way. Thanks for telling me. But the, the spirit is one of, of generosity, grace, not, not quarrels, not, not division. This is something Paul says does no good in the church, and we should, be, we should be aware of it, that this is a wrong handling of Scripture that happens time and time again, sadly, among Christians. Verse 16, he gives another kind of related uh, example of a wrong handling. He says, But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. Uh, says, oh, and their talk will, uh, will spread like gangrene. That, that part I love. Because <laughs> I think that, you, we've, probably many of us have seen that. Right? That there can be, uh, the word babble, uh, we use it to this day, to babble, right? Lots and lots of words. Uh, when it says they're irreverent babble, uh, what it means is words that will not honor the Lord. So they could be untrue words, like just false teaching, or it could just be the way that it's said. Uh, there are a lot of people saying a lot of words about God in churches, in, on the internet, certainly, in a lot of places. And what this is saying is that even back here, the early church, there would be people in the church that had a lot of uh, you get the impression a lot of ideas about God, a lot of things that they think are really interesting or worth saying. But from God's point of view, it's just, it's babbling. 
it, it doesn't line up with what God has revealed about himself. And it's, it's tough sometimes to, to tell the difference. There are people who are very gifted speakers uh, who can captivate an audience and yet are not actually speaking words that line up with, with God's word. There was a woman who came to me uh, a few weeks ago and, and she said, uh, it, was the, it was the sermon on uh, not being ashamed of the gospel, you know, Paul's exhortation. And she said, oh, I was really, I needed to hear that, she said, because, you know, I've been wanting to be able to explain my faith better. And so I went online and I've been watching a lot of uh, atheists or anti-theists who are kind of articulating arguments against the Bible and I've been wanting to try to defend them, but I found myself kind of spiraling down this hole of not actually being sure how to respond to all of the different arguments they have and it's really unsettled my faith. And she said, I, I kind of lost my track, but, but when you... When you pointed in the fact that we're, we should not be ashamed of the gospel, that it is true, historically true, ultimately true, that Jesus came, he died, he was resurrected, she said, it kind of reorientated myself, centered me on the truth of God's word. And, and that's kind of the difference, that there are a lot, of, a lot of talk about God from people who are not Christians, even people who are Christians, but if it tends to lead us farther away from God and unsettle us, then it's, they aren't handling the word of God rightly. But when we're able to hear the word taught or preached and it brings us back to his word, then, then our faith is strengthened rather than, than unsettled. The sense of irreverence, though, can, can, um, can grow in our hearts, I think, without us knowing it. Uh, another thing that came to my mind, there was a, a friend of mine said growing up, uh, on the way back from church every Sunday, his, his parents would kind of uh, pick apart the sermon. Uh, not, not intentionally being like me, but they would just kind of nitpick on e everything. This wasn't said right. I don't think that was right. And, and he said it really impacted him. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, I just grew up thinking, I, whatever I do, I never want to teach the Bible. Because he assumed that everyone who left any sermon, was that's what they were doing. That they were just kind of tearing into this, that whatever was said. And, and there, was, there was a lack of, of, of generosity of spirit. There was an ir irreverence there in terms of the word being preached. That seeped into him, and, and I thought, you know, that, that can happen in any one of our hearts. I know, I know I can have a critical spirit, right? When I go to listen to someone else preach or someone else teach, and I'm always looking for the error rather than, rather than coming to it saying, Lord, what are you going to teach me through this person who, who is far? I'm going to just take them at their word. They love you. They love the Bible. There may be some errors that I might point out, but, but my heart isn't going to be guarded, and, and on the offense, I'm going to be ready to receive. It's a very different posture. Right, in terms of how we receive, how we engage with, with the Word of God. And so what, what Paul is saying here, what he's, he's charging, he's saying, charge them before God, saying to the church, look, you need to, to be in a position where you are rightly handling the Word, meaning you, you do know what is true, but also you have a true heart, a heart that has been impacted by the grace of God. Because the, the alternative is incredibly destructive. Right? All those words, ruins the hearers, leads people in ungodliness, spreads gangrene. It's devastating for a church. And, and Paul has a very specific example. Right? He's not just kind of giving some generalizations here. He's, he's going to tell us about two men who are doing this in the Ephesian church. Uh, so the, rest, the last part of verse 17. Uh, among them, among the ones doing this kind of thing, are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Uh, now, Timothy definitely would have known these guys. Everyone in the church would have known them. In fact, uh, we, we might already know Hymenaeus because uh, he was mentioned in 1 Timothy. So here's what Paul says about Hymenaeus in 1 Timothy. Uh, this is 1 Timothy 1, 19 and 20. He says, By rejecting this, some have made shipwreck of their faith, among whom are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have handed over to Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. So very strong words. That doesn't mean that Paul wants them to be condemned, like in their sin. What, he, what it means is he's kicking them out of the church so that they would feel the weight of their sin. That they would, they would realize that they are separated from the community of faith and that because of their false teaching, because of their lifestyle, they are in a place where they have no assurance of salvation. It's, it's actually a loving thing to, at a certain point, push someone apart, separate. But notice, uh, Paul did this when he was in Ephesus which was years ago. And Hymenaeus was a false teacher, was causing trouble. Paul pushed him out, and now he's back again, which, uh, which often happens. 
with those who are her false teachers who can't just let things go. And now Timothy has to deal with them. And this time Hymenaeus has a new buddy, Philetus, and they are stirring up trouble. And, and Paul mentions specifically what they are uh, teaching that's so bad. He says, um, they have swerved from the truth. This is verse 18. They have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. Now, this is a little tough to understand. The resurrection already happened. You might say, well, I think it did happen, right? Jesus was, was resurrected. That's not what they're talking about. What they were saying is, look, the final resurrection, right? The hope of the Christian church is that there will be a day, the day of judgment, when we will all be resurrected. Just like Jesus was resurrected bodily, physically, we would be resurrected physically, bodily. And this is the hope that, that you have in Christ. Uh, what they were saying is, look, the resurrection, mm, that, that's a spiritual thing. It's not a physical, it's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual reality. And it's already happened. You already have everything in Christ that he wants you, all the spiritual blessings. Which is a little tricky because Paul teaches things that are very similar to this. Now look at Ephesians 1 verse 3. Paul writing to the church in Ephesus, he said, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Paul himself says to the church, look, you have everything. You have, you have forgiveness. You have redemption. You have adoption. You have now purpose. You have spiritual gifts. The Spirit of God is dwelling within you. You have every spiritual blessing right now. Praise God. And that is all true. But Paul would also say, there are more blessings to come. Physical blessings. You don't have that yet. You know it. Just look down, right? We are not perfect physically yet, okay? We are, we are anticipating a day when we do not have to worry about, about illness, about death, about decay. That is the final, the resurrection, just like Jesus. Glorified body, we will have a glorified body. Paul's saying that's, that's coming. And they are saying, no, 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 no. No, look, that if you can live your resurrection life right now. Right? All the, the spiritual blessings, everything that you have is, is right now. And in a sense, what they were doing was denying the future physical resurrection of the church and, by extension, denying the physical resurrection of Christ. They're saying people raised from the dead, look, that, I mean, that's, that's a bit much. But this, this thing, this Christianity thing, this is a spiritual thing. And you still hear people right, talk about that. Right? The focus on the, that we have all the blessings of Christ right now everything, and yet that's not what the Bible teaches. Uh, this was a problem in the early church, and uh, here's how Paul deals with it. This is him uh, writing to the Corinthians about this, this very issue, similar sort of thing, 1 Corinthians 15. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised, and if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith is in vain. And that was, that was the problem, right? There are people whose faith was unsettled because of Hymenaeus and Philetus stirring up these, these false ideas about the resurrection. You can imagine the confusion. So I have everything that God wants me right now because I'm, I'm feeling really sick. I've been struggling with this illness for years. Well, how, do I, how do I understand that? Am I missing something? Is my faith not strong enough? There's confusion because their reality doesn't match up with what God is saying. What Paul is, makes very clear is, look, you, you need to understand, Jesus was raised physically. There will be a day when you are raised physically. Uh, here's how Paul corrects it, just, just so we can see his, his approach to this. 1 Corinthians 15, 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's saying this is the hope of the gospel. There are spiritual blessings, praise God, but there are also physical blessings to come. And we need to see that both are a result of what Jesus did on the cross and that we can have hope, we can have encouragement for what is to come. What Paul is doing here, he's rightly handling the word of God, you see. He's pointing them to what actually is true and what has been revealed. And this is the difference. So let's shift. We've seen there are many ways. There are other ways to wrongly handle the word of God. But the second point is that there is one right way. One right way to handle the word of God. And we see it actually in verse 15. 
This is the, the key verse, right? Verse 15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. That word rightly is a Greek word, orthotomeo, uh, where we get the word ortho, like orthopedic surgeon. What is an orthopedic surgeon? What's his job or her job? To make sure that your bones are straight, right? When they heal, you don't want them to be curved. That's why they put the cast, why they put the pins, everything to make sure it's straight. So that word in the Greek, rightly, means straight. If you think of a quarry, right? How would they want the rock to be cut? Orthoto tomeo, in a straight way, so they could build with right angles. Uh, it also has the connotation of leading down a straight path, okay? No, no deviation, no turning, no curving, but just straight. This is what it means to handle the word of God, that we get it straight. Think of the false teachers. What does Paul say about them? They swerved from the truth, right? This is the challenge with false teaching sometimes. It begins with the truth, Right? It begins with a sense of talking about Jesus, talking about the resurrection, spiritual blessings, that's all good. But then it swerves off into falsehood, and it's tough to tell which, which, which is which. To rightly handle the word means that we, we stay true to the word as revealed. So here's the mental picture, uh, I think, that is, that is most helpful in terms of how you know if you or if someone else is rightly handling the word of God. Picture a straight line between what God says in the Bible and what you are saying or what the other person is saying. If there's a straight line, meaning if what the person is saying, you can go back and be like, oh yeah, okay, I get it. That's, that's what God is saying. Then the word of God has been handled rightly. If someone's saying something and it sounds spiritual, because you can say a lot of Christian-y things, but if it's not actually here in the Bible, then it's been wrongly handled. If there's a curve or it ends up somewhere else. So, so the picture, when, when Paul says, rightly handling the word of God, it means a straight line between what is, what is spoken, what is taught, and what actually God has revealed, which has a lot of very practical implications for how we, how we engage with the Bible as a, as a church. Anytime you're speaking uh, about biblical things or, or about you know, what God might say, you would be thinking to yourself, is that actually what is here in the Bible? Anytime you hear someone teach, anytime you hear someone preach, Right? We gather here not to hear my ideas about what God is saying or, or my interpretation or my opinions or some new theological insight. Anytime you come to hear a sermon, you should be hearing what has already been said many, many, many times throughout all of the millennia because there, God has given us everything that we need already in his word. The role of the preacher is simply to help explain it, to help apply it, and this is what Paul does. Look at this example. It's really clear. Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, so a little bit earlier from where we were before. Look at how he introduces this, this truth. He says, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. And then he goes on to talk about the gospel. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He was raised. But notice that. What is he doing there? He's saying the thing that I'm telling you is just the same thing that God told me. Right? It's not my idea. Right? If you want to know whether you can believe me, this, this is what I received from Christ, and this is what I'm telling you. That, that is what it looks like to rightly handle the Word of God. That you go away from a, a class or a, a sermon or whatever it is, and, and you're wrestling with the Word, not, not the words of the preacher. You shouldn't ever go away like wrestling with what, what I said. It, it, hopefully, if I'm doing my job well, you're here and looking, oh yeah, this is what God is saying, and it's a tough thing, and I need to think about it. The challenge, of course, is that uh, usually good speaking, right, good public speaking involves things like illustrations, uh, stories, analogies. You see that. Jesus does that. Paul does that. It's just, it's a good way to engage. And so that's a good thing, but also a bit of a dangerous thing uh, because it's, it's possible to, to tell stories that um, are just fun stories or just interesting uh, that, that the speaker just wants people to stay engaged, and so it's not actually uh, connected to what God is saying. It's just a, it's just a cool story. Uh, I remember hearing um, Kent Hughes. He's a, he's a pastor and writes a lot of biblical commentaries. I was in a preaching seminar with him, and he was cautioning us about that. He said, listen, you have to be careful about what you do. He said, you can evoke an emotional response in people that has nothing to do with what God is doing. 
He's like, he's like, I have a story that I could tell about my dog dying that is incredibly sad. He said, I, I know that everyone in my church will be tearing up. They'll be emotional. They'll go away feeling like they had some sort of experience, but it, it had nothing to do with the Bible. It's just an emotional experience, and, and it can masquerade as something significant that has happened. But his point was, we as the church, we don't just need emotional experiences, intellectual experiences. We don't just need to be entertained. We, need, we come to experience God himself, Christ himself, through his word, through his spirit. And that is only going to happen if whatever the person up here says is serving the text, is pointing back to the text. And, and I'd say, as I reflected back over my journey, I'm like, there have been times where I've been guilty of this. There's a cool story or something I want to say, and it hasn't, it's obscured what God is saying rather than helped it. I have to confess that. I want to do better going forward. And so in light of that, I have a story. This may be dangerous, but <laughs> I have a story that I think is helpful. You can tell me after it actually is. So I, I came across this uh, obituary this week of uh, this man. His name's uh, Pastor Hugh Homer. Uh, he died this week, and uh, he grew up in Germany. Uh, he grew up in the uh, 20s and 30s. Uh, he, he was, uh, I think, a teenager. I think during, during the war, he didn't fight in the war. Uh, but once he graduated uh, and the, the World War II was over, he decided he wanted to be a Lutheran minister. And so he went to school to be a Lutheran minister. Now, at that time, they were dividing Germany into two, west and east. And uh, the communists had the east, right? And uh, the allies had the west. His parents moved to West Germany. They could see what was going on. They're like, we, we want to get out while we can. But he felt a sense of calling. I think, I, I think that East Germany is going to need pastors, is what he thought. And oddly enough, this was, I thought, interesting, the communists actually allowed there to be some uh, seminaries, some schools where they taught pastors, Lutheran pastors, because they knew the Lutherans had been against the Nazis. So they said, okay, you can still have your school. So we got trained in East Germany. And after he was trained, he was uh, assigned this uh, small church in northern Germany. And as he tells the story, he says, uh, it actually went very, very bad at first. Uh, not because of anything to do with the communists, but just because uh, he, he was not connecting with his church. Uh, he came in full of uh, excitement. This often happens. Young, young preachers, a lot of ideas. A lot of He would spend all his time in his sermon writing all of these words and stories and all sorts of things. And he would get up in the pulpit and he's very animated, very like this and a lot of trying to, yeah, I want you to feel what I'm feeling. He said it was like crickets. He didn't say crickets, but that's what I'm thinking. Just quiet, no response. People were not being stirred up to love the Lord more. They didn't seem to be growing. They didn't seem to be connecting with him. And, and after weeks and months of this, he was just, he was at a point of crisis. And so he picked up the works of Martin Luther and, and, and was reading over them. And Martin Luther had this conviction that he would, he would only preach one message, essentially. And that message was, your sins are forgiven. That was the message, the gospel message. And so you, Homer, he said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I'm going to stop with all of the other words and all the things. I'm just going to, week in, week out, I'm just going to preach this message from the word, wherever it is, and apply it. And he said it changed everything. Uh, here, here's a quote from him where he talks about this time. He says, I simply proclaimed the grace of God and how we can take hold of it by faith. He later said, and lo and behold, this offer of the gospel came alive in the hearts of many people, gave assurance of forgiveness, and made them feel, made them free and joyful. For where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life and salvation. Transformed his church. Why? Because he was simply going back to the word. Here is what, here's what God's message to you. My hope here at Tri-City is you see this message coming through week in, week out, that God loves us, that he's for us that he has sent his son to die for us because we are sinful people. What you, Homer, experienced, my hope is that we experience as well. And, and really, it's simply that we are sticking to the straight goods of the gospel. That we are, we are being transformed, not by words of, of human beings, but by the words of God. And that those words are powerful because they speak to a reality, something that actually happened. The son of God came and he died so that we might have life. This is the only right way to handle the word, that the gospel is central and that everything that is said can be tied back to the Bible itself. And again, I would say this is not, this is not just for preachers. Right? All of us speak, hopefully, things about the Bible, think about our lives, think about what God is doing, 
And so we are thinking theological thoughts. And we should be asking ourselves, are the things I'm thinking and saying actually there in the Bible? A few weeks ago, a guy came up to me from the church and he said, listen, man, I got a question for you. Um, There's something that, you know, I've sort of had this idea all my life about how uh, things are going to happen in the end. And I just got, but I'm not, someone asked me the day, is it in the Bible? I just got to ask you, is this actually in the Bible? And I thought, what a great question. That's the question, really. The things that I'm thinking, things that I've assumed to be true, maybe because I heard it in a church somewhere, is it, can I actually find it here? Is this actually what God is saying? This will help us to know whether, in fact, we are rightly or wrongly handling the word of God. And if it's, if it's wrongly, we, we need to see the warning here is clear. It's going to only lead to people's faith being unsettled, us being farther away from each other, farther from the Lord. But if we're handling it rightly, it will be powerful. It will be life-giving. Now, you can imagine Timothy hearing this from Paul and I think being encouraged, right? Like, okay, yes, I got to do this. But also, I mean, the Ephesian church, they had troubles for a long time, right? I mean, you could think of Timothy saying, Paul, if you couldn't deal with the false teachers in the church, how am I going to? I'm younger. People don't respect me as much. This guy, Hymenaeus, I'm sure an older man in the church. Like, this is, this is tough. You could imagine, I think, rightly, that Timothy would be pretty discouraged. So I think this last verse, uh, just in this little section, I think is meant to bring comfort to Timothy, and, and probably to us as well. Uh, it's kind of a response to that idea. So verse 19 begins, but. So Paul's kind of saying, in light of this reality, right, that there's, there's people in the church quarreling, uh, fighting, teaching wrong things, upsetting the faith of some. Like, in light of the fact, Timothy, you could be kind of uh, disheartened, but, remember this, but God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. He's saying, even if things are shaken, Timothy, the, the firm foundation of God cannot be shaken. And he points out two things. One, the Lord knows those who are his. That's an incredibly comforting thought, is it not? God, God knows who are his. Have you ever wondered about that? Have you find yourself thinking, does God even, is he even aware of what's going on in my life? He doesn't even know that the challenges that are happening in my family or maybe for a pastor in my church. This is a firm foundation that the church is built upon. The Lord knows who are his. And, and for, for us, I mean, that's immediately encouraging, uh, comforting, I think. But for Timothy, he, he would have known that's actually an allusion to um, a story, something that happened in the Old Testament. If you look in your study Bible, it'll probably reference Numbers 16. And this was a story that happened to Moses. Moses, right? Hero of the faith. Moses, appointed by God, leading all of God's people through the Red Sea miraculously. And yet, if you know the story, people weren't always happy with Moses. After they got through, they're like, where's the food? Where's the water? And they began to push back against him. And Korah was someone who led actually a rebellion against Moses, who came to Moses and said, look, Moses, you know what? We're all God's chosen people. Why are you so lifted up? Who put you in charge? Right? Moses' response he was on his face, just, just, just praying. He was brokenhearted because of the rebellion. Seeing the, this guy doesn't see the truth that, that I have been appointed for your good. But he uses the phrase, he says to Korah, uh, in the morning, the God will show who is his. And, and he does. It goes really bad for those people. The earth opens up. They get swallowed up. Fire comes down from heaven. It's not, it's, it's, it's harsh. It's, it's true though. It's, it's righteous judgment. And that doesn't happen in the Ephesian church, but the reference to it is comforting because what it means for Timothy is, look, God, he knows who his people are. And even if there are false teachers in the church, even if there are those that are stirring up trouble, in the end, everything is going to be revealed. Those who are causing harm to the church, they will be judged. You don't have to worry. And if you're in the hands of God through Christ, you don't have to worry. You will be kept. Your faith will be preserved. But there's one other little bit that's added. The, the second thing to the seal, right? The Lord knows those who are his and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So interesting here because we've been talking basically about what we say about God, right? What we teach, what we preach, how we, how we handle the word of God. But then here at the end, there's, there's our actions. And it's important that we see there's always a connection. There's always a connection between a right handling of the word of God that we're speaking about it, thinking about it well, and then how we live. 
Those two things always go together. And what Paul's saying is everyone who names the name of the Lord, everyone who seeks to truly be a faithful follower of God, they are the ones who are actually going to be living the Bible. Not just speaking about it rightly, living it rightly. And so I'm going to end with one final story. Uh, this again is about you, Homer. This is actually why he was, he was in the thing I was reading. And that's because you, Homer, uh, did his ministry in East Germany, and it was difficult. Even though the communists let them kind of have a church in some way and be trained, they really were quite uh, oppressive, a lot of persecution. There were spies always in the church looking for, to see if they were subverting the government, and at times they needed you to teach the Bible properly. You, couldn't, you weren't aligned with communist ideologies. It was an atheist ideology, and so there's a lot of pushback, a lot of adversity. And there was one man that was um, leading all of this, and this is him, Eric Honecker. He was the uh, communist leader, and actually, he, had, he wasn't the leader right away, but he knew of Homer. He kind of all the way along had been spying on Homer, had been watching him, had been pushing back against him. Eric uh, Honecker's wife was in charge of post-secondary uh, everything in East uh, Germany. And um, when you, Homer, he had about seven kids, every single one of them was rejected from every university in East Germany. This was the kind of persecution Right? Just, they made it hard on the Christians. They made it hard on everyone. Everyone looked at this man as corrupt, which he was, as, as heartless. He was the one who uh, instigated the uh, shoot uh, to kill, or I think that was the terminology, anyone trying to go over the Berlin Wall. He approved. He said, you, you shoot them. 300 people at least died trying to escape. Th this was the regime that, that he uh, presided over and that uh, Pastor Homer tried to do ministry under. Well, of course, everything shifted, right, once the Berlin Wall fell. And inter interestingly, uh, the Soviets, uh, they realized that the tide was turning, and so they tried to pin most everything on Honecker. So as the Berlin Wall was falling, they stripped him of his title, they stripped him of all of his property, he had lots of houses, he had lots of cars, he was so corrupt. And this man, who was at once the leader of East Germany, he found himself homeless. He was sick. He went to the hospital for a while. He came out. He had nowhere to go. So guess where he went? He went to you, Homer's door and knocked on the door and said, well, will you help us for me and my wife? And so put, put yourself in that position as, as someone who's been just for years, your family's been enduring hardship and difficulty because of this man, and now he's at your door. And you, Homer, they, they thought about it a bit. They, they prayed about it, and they welcomed him in. For 10 weeks, they lived under the same roof. He and his wife, the, the kids are, they cleared out the bedroom upstairs. They stayed there as soon as it happened. Uh, and the international, like the media, news media found out, they came to his door. What a story, right? This, this man who was persecuted is now extending a, a house and care. And, and there was quite a, you know, a lot of news stories about it. But you can also imagine there were those in East Germany, those Christians who were not happy. People who were not happy. Christians and not. They said, what are you doing this man is the reason that our life has been so horrible for all of these years. I, I know God's love. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But look, look at what he did to us. That's what they would say to him. Here's what you Homer said. He said, this is the right thing to do for an old sick man. When we pray to forgive our sins and forgive those who sinned against us, we must take these commands seriously. Do you see what he's doing there? He's doing two things. He's rightly handling the word of God. This is what God says, right? We, this is, as Christians, we've been forgiven by God and we're called to forgive others. So this is what God says and this is how we should live. There's a straight line in both cases, rock solid. I'm clear about what God has commanded me to and so it's very clear how I should live. I need to depart from iniquity. A any sense of unforgiveness, bitterness, anger, I need to put those aside. Why? Because that's how God treated me. And that's what God's word says. It's a, it's a picture for us, a crystal clear picture of what it should look like in our lives to know the word of God and then to live it. It's authoritative, it's true, it's life-giving. And if we believe that, then even when something like this, I mean, what, what could be harder? Even when this kind of thing happens, we know what we should do. We turn away from sin. We walk the straight path that's illuminated by the word of God so that people will see in us the gospel. They don't just hear it from our lips. They need to do that. 
but also they will see it. And we will be led closer to Christ, and they will as well. So the application for us as a church, I think, is really clear, right? We just need to think about the way that we're speaking about the Word of God, the way that we're interacting with each other. Is there any quarrelsomeness? Is there, is there any wrong handling in our heart, in our mind? And are there areas where the Word is speaking to us and saying, look, this is, this is what you do, and we've turned a blind eye. We've hardened our heart. Are there areas where we just need to confess and say, Lord, I, just, I haven't done this right. Please forgive me and help me to walk the path that is, that is straight, that is right in light of your word. Let me pray that for us as we close. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. Where would we be without it, Lord? It brings peace to know that you've given us everything that we need for life and godliness. You, you've written it down. We don't have to wonder. We don't have to worry. You've made it crystal clear, your love for us, what Christ has done for us. There is no ambiguity. There is nothing really to, to debate. It's revealed in Scripture. It's corroborated in the pages of history. Jesus, you came. You died. We needed you, and you came. We can go the rest of our lives, each and every moment of the day, being absolutely certain that you love us because of the Bible, because you've written it down, because because it recorded what actually happened. And so I pray for us as a church. I, I pray that, that that grace that we've experienced, that, that we, would, um, we would live that out in the way that we handle the word, that we would be very concerned about making sure we get things right, but also very concerned about, about treating each other in a loving way. So God, would, would you just help, would you move amongst us, Lord, to, to help to temper any sense of quarrelsomeness, any words that we're listening to that aren't really tethered to Scripture, God, would you help us just to, to ignore them, to cut them off? And Lord, may we, be, may we be looking each and every time that we open our mouths that there's a straight line from what we are saying to, to what you have already said in your word and to our lives as well. And I pray that through that, we would be built up, you would be honored, you'd be glorified, and that more and more people would, would come to Christ, would actually see the difference, see the hope, and want it for themselves. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are going to respond.